Welcome all. Thank you for joining us for today's session. This is the fourth session of From Grapes to Wine School Climate Webinars. My name is Nesli Hanivit. I'm the winemaking and, uh, winemaking and innovation specialist with Perenia. And our co-host is Francisco Diaz. He's the viticulture specialist. Today's topic is how do consumers describe Nova Scotia wines? Before uh, starting with our presentation, some Zoom housekeeping items. Um, the audience will have the audio and video turn off during the webinar, but we do encourage you to make questions. And to do so, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And when the presentation of our speaker finish, there will be a Q&A session. And in, those session, in that session, Francisco will be addressing your questions to our speaker. And a brief introduction to Perenia. Perenia is a provincial development agency with a vision to render Nova Scotia a recognized world leader in producing innovative, environmentally responsible, safe food of impeccable quality. And our mission is supporting growth, transformation, and economic development in Nova Scotia's agriculture, seafood, food, and beverage sectors. We have a wide range of service areas. It starts from agriculture to quality and food safety, food product development, lab services, and also fisheries. Our wine related services um, also applies in a wide range from wine to wine. We have size assessment services, viticulture, plant health lab, winemaking services, a mobile uh, bottling truck with filtration, and also business development services. And in today's session, uh, we are lucky to have uh, attendees from different countries of the, around the world. That's why I would like to make a brief introduction uh, of Nova Scotia wines and Nova Scotia wine scenery. In the last two decades in Nova Scotia, the vineyard acreage and number of wineries has been increasing. And today we have more than 1,200 acres of vineyards, which is 485 hectares, and more than 20 wineries. And um, we grow more than 70 different grape um, varieties for winemaking. And those are both interspecific inter hybrids and Vitis vinifera. In interspecific hybrids, we have, uh, just to give some examples, we have Leca de Blanc, New York Muscat, Maréchal Foch, and Marquette. And from Vitis vinifera, uh, Chardonnay, Riesling, and Pinot Noir, just to mention a couple of them. And um, when we look at the wines, it, we, with this um, wide range of varieties, we can produce different types of wines. And those wines are uh, mainly for local consumers, but also some for export. Um, the main focus of winemaking is white steel wines. And from there, it's uh, very important to highlight Tidal Bay. Tidal Bay is the unique appellation of Nova Scotia. And uh, that is an appellation for producing uh, off dry still white wine, which shows the characteristic of the cool climate of Nova Scotia with its crisp, crisp acidity. And then the other types of wines are red wines, rosé wines, sparkling wines, and also a small quantity of ice wines and dessert and fortified wines are also, also produced. And um, when we look at the consumers, and Nova Scotians are, um, give a high interest to the, to the wines that are produced locally in our region. And to give a deeper uh, look to the consumers um, in Nova Scotia, wine consumers in Nova Scotia, we have invited uh, Matt Maxwini. And we are lucky to have his expertise today with us. And Matt Maxwini he has a Bachelor of Science and PhD in Food Science at the University of Guelph. And he currently focused on sensory science and, uh, at Acadia University since 2013. He studies on sensory aspect of food, taste, aroma, appearance, and texture, and also factors that influence acceptability of food products. His recent studies include use of new sensory methods, 3D printing, the production of new food products from alternative grains and food waste, and, of, and finally, of course, Nova Scotia wines. 
And with that, I will leave the screen to Matt. Thank you so much to Nestle and Perenia for inviting me to be here. I'm really excited. Um, this is kind of going to be the highlights of a study we did over three and a half years on Nova Scotia wine, but I hope you enjoy it and we're just going to work our way through. <clears throat> so um, the objective of this whole study was to determine the sensory attributes that consumers use to describe Nova Scotia wines, as it says there. Um, and traditionally, wines have been described using um, trained panels, descriptive analysis and lexicons. And really what I wanted to do with this study and what my students want to do is we wanted to figure out what people actually say about the wine. And so the example I like to use is, um, you know, I don't, when I drink wine, I don't always think about the wine I'm drinking. I might be eating like a cheeseburger and I'm just drinking a wine and enjoying my life. And then I think about the words I use to tell my friend that I like that wine or tell my partner why I like the wine. And that's really what we wanted to do with this study. We wanted to look at the words that the consumers are actually using to talk about the wines, not what um, experts or sommeliers or other wine professionals were talking about. We also kind of wanted to look at um, look at the wine wheel, the aroma wine wheel by NC Novo, and look at it and then look at what words from that wine wheel consumers are actually using in their everyday life. And so basically what we decided to do was for about three and a half years, as I said, we recruited consumers of varying wine knowledge. We didn't want anyone who worked in the wine industry in it. And we wanted to give, give them a variety of different wines and just ask them to basically put the wines together they think are similar, uh, move the wines around to show that they're different, and then use words they would actually use in their everyday life to describe the wine. So just some background. Um, Notably, we run, ran the study from 2017 to 2020. Um, the sensory trials were conducted in all in Nova Scotia. They were conducted mainly in Wolfville at Acadia University where I work, but also we did some studies in Halifax to get a wider array of different consumers. Uh, for those of you not from Nova Scotia, Halifax is about an hour away driving, I don't know, 87 kilometers, maybe something like that. And we really just wanted to focus on what consumers are finding in the wine, because as you all know, probably for coming to this talk, the wine world is kind of changing. We have the old world wines and new world wines, and they're all kind of mixing together now. And they are now fighting for mainly consumers. So we wanted to look at how people are talking about their wine. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we understood what words they're using so the Nova Scotia wineries could relate to them and tell them about their wine, their, the wine they're producing in a way that consumers understand. Also in this study, we did have, uh, we did evaluate all the consumers wine knowledge and we looked at their wine purchasing behavior. So I'll talk about that briefly as well. But we wanted to look at, first of all, how they self-identified with their wine knowledge, how they self-identified their interest in wine. And then when they came to the actual sensory trial, we actually gave them an objective wine knowledge quiz as well to see their actual wine knowledge, not just self-identifying. All right. So we the study evaluated 87 different wines, all produced in Nova Scotia. As you can see there, we included 20 eight red wines, 14 blends, and 14 single varietal. We also included 28 white wines, 14 bloods, 14 single varietal wines. We had 10 rosés and 10 sparkling wines. And then we also included 11 Tidal Bay wines. And as Nestle said at the beginning, that's an Appalachian wine um, from Nova Scotia. All the wines we looked at were available across the province. And that means they were sold through the Nova Scotia Liquor Commission, meaning that they are available to almost anyone in the whole province, if they can get to the provincial body, Nova Scotia Liquor Commission that sells the wine. And we wanted to make sure we did that. We didn't want to pick and choose wine that was only available at wineries. We wanted to make sure we had a wide array of wine that was available to everyone. Now, what we did with these wines is we decided to use projective mapping and ultra flash profiling. And basically we decided to do that because it's a rapid method that gives you a lot of information very quickly. It does not require experts or trained panelists. And as I said before, we didn't want experts to train panelists. We wanted consumers. And also it lets you generate a vocabulary for the given pro product from the ultra uh, flash profiling. 
So basically, well, I'm going to go through projective mapping first, then the ultra fast profiling. And with projective mapping is a method of assessing um, and describing differences among samples. So as you can see in the picture here, there's eight uh, white wines here. They usually would have a lid on it, but for the sake of the picture, we took them off. And they were, what would happen is a consumer or panelist would show up. They'd be given the eight wines and they would ask to be sort them based on what wines they think are similar and white wines they think are different on a two dimensional space, which I'll show in one second. We also asked them, to write down some descriptive words for each sample and that would be the ultra flash profiling so we asked them to just describe the wine briefly two to three words about each sample um, and we did this a number of different times and we did this using the CompuSense cloud software so when you sat down in your booth you were given your eight wines and all of these teardrops i'm going to call them right here would be over here in this blank space and what you would do is you would taste the wine and then you would drag and drop the teardrop onto the bullseye area here. You can use the whole rectangle, doesn't have to be on the target or the bullseye. And what you would do is you put wines you think are similar, close together, and wines that you think are different, far apart. So for instance, this sample to this sample, quite different. And then once you drop the wine, what ended up happening is it, a box opened and asked you to describe the wine. And so you could type in as many words as you wanted to describe the wine. And what ends up happening is you end up creating your own bank of words down here to describe the different wines. So for instance, if you thought this sample was sweet, you typed in sweet. And then the next time you, uh, let's say drop this sample, you also thought it was sweet, you could select sweet again from your bank of words. Um, the reason why we chose projective mapping ultra flash profiling is because it has been used in many sensor trials before evaluating wine, and it has been very valuable to people to figure out similarities and difference to the wine. But also we wanted to make sure that we're, we're getting the words people are actually using. So when you first sat down, this bank would be completely empty and you would be the one filling up the word bank with words that you use to describe the wine. I can tell you that a lot of um, the panelists we have were kind of annoyed with that. They wanted to be told what the wine, what words they should use. And I had a lot of questions about that, but eventually we ended up getting, um, you know, enough people showing up and it was, uh, I lost my train of thought. Sorry, just going down a hole. Um, and eventually they started describing the wine really well, which is awesome. But um, like I said, there was complaints from many people that they would rather be told what the wine tastes like than to think of themselves, but we wanted to figure out what they wanted. Um, just a little background, pa pa participants were encouraged to take as many sniffs or sips as necessary to assess the wine. They were asked to drink the, the wine any order they wanted. Um, they were asked to take a drink of water between each sample. Also, before they got into the booths, we actually did practice uh, tasks with them using sandwich cookies. So uh, making sure they understood how the projective mapping, the ultra flash profiling worked, making sure they understood that similar samples should be put close together and different samples should be put far apart. Now, speaking about the participants themselves, we actually had over a thousand participants take part in the study over the three years. Um, all were over the age of 19, as that's the legal drinking age in Nova Scotia. Um, we recruited them from around using posted advertised words of mouth and all that stuff, but basically they were allowed to be in the study if they consumed wine in the last two weeks, and if they self-identified as regularly bought and consumed wine, and if so, they're asked to participate in the study. We also asked them to self-identify their wine knowledge, and then during the sensory trial themselves, they took an objective wine knowledge survey after completing the trial. Um, I can tell you that based on the demographics these people buy a lot of wine i i don't know if there's a nice way to put that other than maybe a high frequency purchaser of wine especially of local wine they bought a lot of it um they're very very interested in wine about over 80 percent of them said they had a high interest in wine so that's great but to be honest with you, most of them had a low amount of knowledge about wine. Um, the majority of our panelists fell into the lowest or a low objective knowledge of wine. They also self-identified about 65 of them, 65% of them of having a low knowledge of wine. So that's not great. They really like to drink wine, but they don't really know much about wine. And when I say objective wine knowledge, um, quiz this was you know basic facts about wine um you know asking them 
um, I'm trying to think of a good example question, just asking them what, what, what's a rosé wine and having a multiple choice answer. And um, some of the responses were not the best and stuff like that. So just quickly for the statistical analysis, um, we did use multiple factor analysis. So basically all the information for the projective mapping and the ultra flash profile sessions, and we did a lot of different sessions, were all analyzed using uh, multiple factor analysis. The analysis included where the panelists placed the samples on the computer screen based on the X and Y coordinates. And we used the bottom left corner as the origin, zero, zero, and then where they put it was X and Y. Also, we used the descriptors from the ultra flash profile um, as supplementary data. Um, you know, this is pretty standard for running a projective mapping ultra flash profiling trial, so I'm not going to go into much of it. But also we did include intensities of attributes were treated as separate attributes, meaning if someone wrote very sweet, that was different than sweet. Um, we wanted to keep those separate. And lastly, based on the study by Kemp and others, um, we only used descriptions that were uh, identified four or more times by the participants. We didn't want to have, you know, a person like, one um, attribute that person said once including our analysis, that's not gonna give us a good result. So basically just a rundown of our study. We broke down our study into five phases. Um, phase one was the red wines and we did four sessions or four projective mapping and ultra flash profiling trials um, that included 320 participants. We also did four sessions for the white wines including 327 participants. We then moved on to the rosé wines and the sparkling wines, which included 168 and 157 participants, but we only had did two sessions of testing for rosé and sparkling wines. And lastly, the Tidal Bay wines, we did two sessions uh, with 156 participants, and that was our phase five, that was our final phase. But um, we're not actually, I'm actually not going to talk about phase five today because most of the results from the Tidal Bay wines were covered by what was identified in the white wine uh, phase two. So we'll just go through phase one, two, three, four today. And I'm also going to talk about some add-ins we had, some things we added on to this overall study of figuring out how consumers describe wine. So as I said, with the red wine phase, there was four sessions of testing. And it's uh, as stated before, it evaluated 24 different red wines. And every session of testing, we had seven different wines and we had one duplicate sample. So one wine was given to the participants twice just to see how reproducible the results were, just to make sure they understood, in, they, they could identify that these wines are the same or at least similar and stuff like that. Um, as we see here, this first, oh, this is actually, I apologize. This is actually session four four, so the fourth session of the red wines. Um, and as you can see, we had 79 participants and they ended up using 75 different terms to evaluate these seven different wines in the one duplicate sample. Um, now, as I said in the statistical analysis, we cut out any terms that were not used four or more times. And we ended up with this by plot here. And as you can see in the by plot, uh, wine 13 here was the one that was duplicated. And it was placed by the participants very close together. That was very, made us very excited and happy. That means they could identify that the wines are the same or at least similar. And for every session we're gonna to discuss today, um, the participants were able to place the duplicate sample close to um, its counterpart or um, so that's great, except for one session in one session of the white wines. I don't know what happened. They went a little weird and they're quite far apart. Um, but other than that, in every session we ran, the participants did a good job of isolating the two samples that were the same, which is great. Also, it, that's very good because it means they can discriminate um, uh, the, the different sensory properties of the wine, even though they may not have the wine knowledge or the, um, the overall wine knowledge and stuff like that. Um, also, just to bring it up, I'm not going to list off, um, you know, the wineries who made the wines and stuff in this scenario, but I can tell you that the panelists did a very good job of separating wines based on uh, the variety of grapes in the wine, which was great. We we're pretty excited about that. And um, 
realistically, we saw a lot of good separation. Once again, I made us happy because we were a little worried based on the objective wine knowledge quiz, how, how much they knew about wine, how they're going to separate wine, how they're going to discriminate the wine, sorry, differentiate the what, what. All right. So this is after the four sessions of sensory trials on the red wine. Um, you can see uh, these are the top 15 terms they use to describe the wine in every session. And overall, the participants use approximately 70 to 75 terms in each session. So in session one, 70 descriptors were used, session two, 77, session three, 71, and session four, which I just showed, there were 75. On average, participants use 2.2 words to describe each wine sample. And as you can see here, the ones that are bolded are the, uh, are the terms that they used in every single um, session to describe it. And as you, as you would kind of expect, they use sweet and bitter a lot. And as you can see, sweet and bitter are almost all near the top, meaning they're used the most um, to describe the wine. They also use fruity a lot, as you can see in session one, session two, it's three. And, th and then it's the second most word used word in session three and in session four. And lastly, the one term they used in all four sessions was cranberry. Um, that was kind of interesting to me because cranberry is not on the aroma wine wheel and it came up a lot in our studies on red wine. Um, but just something to think about. I think it, I, when we, we worked that websites, they put in the red fruits category, but it's not something that I see in a lot of wine bottle descriptions, cranberry. Um, but also one of the big takeaways that you're gonna see a lot is that the participants, even though when they came to do the session, they were told they can sort the wine based on anything they want, appearance, aroma, taste, and uh, mouthfeel or texture. What you see here, and you're gonna see this throughout all, all the, uh, the whole study is that the consumers really focus on the aroma and the taste attributes. Um, they don't really talk at all about the appearance and that might have been an issue with the method giving them eight wines, they're all you know red and they might be like, well, I'm not gonna say they're red, but they were different, different colors of red. They barely ever talked about the appearance. Um, when we look at the four attributes that were used um, in three of the four sessions, we look at full body, dry, acidic and floral. And there we see that they're finally, the consumers are starting to look at more than just the aroma and taste, starting to talk a little bit more about the mouthfeel and the texture of the wine samples. And the last, thing that um, is a big takeaway from this that you might be looking at and if your background is in sensory you might uh, already have picked up on this but they like to use the word light a lot and they use light and light taste and light flavor and, and you know they just like to say light consumers in general and in some studies, people have removed light. Uh, we didn't remove it because we want we wanted to keep it in because it, it's obviously something that they use consumers are using a lot to describe what they're tasting. Um, and we've actually we actually see this a lot in the white wines too. But a lot of times they're talking about light, but we don't know. Uh, I, we've talked with consumers after the trials, being like, "What did you mean by light? Were you talking about the taste, the aroma, or the appearance, or stuff like that?" And we had very conflicting views on what uh, light means to consumers. So that's something um, we've kind of been working on a little, uh, a little further right now. All right, so just brief, briefly, like I said, these are just the highlights. The overall, the red wines were separated by per, the consumer's perceived sweetness and bitterness. Sweetness and bitterness were opposites on every bipot from every session. Um, they were the most frequently used terms by this, the, the, the uh, participants to describe the red wine samples. Um, this was an expected re result. Sweetness is, is used in many, many studies to describe red, red wines as is bitterness. Fruity was also frequently used by the participants to describe the wine. Um, and it was almost always very well associated with this, this, I'm sorry, fruitiness was always associated with the sweetness of the wine. So they were always very close on the bipots. And lastly, the fourth most frequently used term was cranberry. As I said before, that kind of came out of left field for us. We weren't expecting cranberry to show up so much. And we've followed up with some people to ask them, why they've used cranberry and that's kind of ongoing still.
I'm sorry if I'm talking a little fast. Um, just trying to hit the highlights for you here. Um, so phase two um, moved on to the white wines. As we said, I said before, 24 different wines were evaluated, 14 blends, uh, sorry, 28 different wines, 14 blends, uh, 14 single varietal wines. And once again, every session involves seven wines with one duplicate sample, so eight wine samples overall. And the first thing that we got that we've picked up on is that when it came to the sessions on white wines, consumers use a lot more words to describe white wines than red wines. And um, you can see this here with, you know, session uh, four had 79 consumers and had 75 terms. This is session six and it has 80 consumers and they already used 95 terms. And we, we looked in that a little bit more and always with the white wines, consumers were listing more descriptors for each sample than on average than usual. Um, we're, this is just an example here. Once again, you can see the duplicate samples pretty close together, 49.1, 49.2, indicating that they could, uh, fig they figured out they were similar, if not the same sample. Once again, the frequency of terms, you can see here, they once again used sweetness and bitterness to describe the wine samples uh, very frequently. Um, but just to reiterate our point, they used a lot more wines, I mean, a lot more words to describe them. So they used um, on average 95 different words to describe the white wines compared to the average of about 73 different words to describe the red wines. Um, four common terms that were identified in each session, these terms included sweet, um, bitter, as I said. Also, we have the term apple show up in all four different sessions. And we once again have that word light uh, show up. Um, they love, like I said, the consumers really enjoyed saying light. And I understand why people remove it from their results because it doesn't tell you that much. But really, um, we're, we're digging in trying to figure out why they keep saying light. Um, other terms that were included in three of the four sessions were aftertaste, sour, strong, and citrus. So strong suffers from the same issue as light, right? We don't know if they're talking about strong aroma, flavor, um, mouthfeel, et cetera. But the one thing that really seemed to happen a lot when we looked at the, all the sessions we ran is that aftertaste was very important to the consumers when they were evaluating the white wine. We didn't see aftertaste show up as much in our other trials, but they really talked about aftertaste. But the one thing is they didn't describe the aftertaste. They just said aftertaste. So there was an aftertaste presence when they were evaluating the white wines. And when we looked at our data for how familiar they are with wines, we thought we would see a correlation to having you know more white wine drinkers in the study and therefore they're more familiar with white wine therefore that's why they use more words to describe white wines and that's why they were digging in more to the aftertaste and stuff like that but we actually didn't find any correlations there we actually had a really good mix of um, percentage of, of people who were primarily white wine drinkers was about 51 percent of the study and then we had red wine drinkers was actually about 46 percent of the study and then the rest they really just drank yeah, for, you know, they just drank whatever wine showed up in their glass, they kind of stated. So um, we didn't see a good correlation there, but, you know, it's something to think about is they're definitely, the consumers in Nova Scotia definitely feel more comfortable describing white wine rather than red. All right, overall, the white wines were once again described as being bitter and sweet, and they sep were separated the wines based on these uh, two descriptors on all the biplots for white wine. They use many more terms to discuss white wine than they did red, rosé, and sparkling. You can see there, on average, 2.9 uh, terms per sample for white wine. Uh, red was 2.2, and then we get into the rosé and the sparkling, and that's 1.8 words and only two words per sample. Lastly, more so than any other um, uh, phase, I guess we'll say, or any other wines included. They, they did identify aftertaste a lot when talking about white wine, but they didn't describe the aftertaste, which would have been nice. Um, what kind of, you know, is it bitter, metallic, et cetera, aftertaste. They just indicated there was a presence or lack of aftertaste um, when they were talking about white wines. So 
now we're going to move on to the rosé wines, but this is where we kind of added to the study a bit. Um, we still did our projective mapping and ultra flash profiling um, on the 10 rosé wines, but we wanted to add to it. Um, so we actually added a secondary objective was after we finished our projective mapping and ultra flash profiling sessions, we wanted to look at if caloric labels, how much calories are in, in the serving of wine would impact the consumer's sensory perception. So what we did is from the projective mapping sessions, we took the most frequently cited terms and then we conducted a separate sensory trial with uh, 260 people uh, using nine point dog scales and a check all apply question to see if the caloric labels had any impact on their sensory perception of the wine. So we had every participant evaluate the wine firstly blinded and then with uh, four different fabricated nutrition labels which I will show next. But just before we jump ahead, just some takeaways from the projective mapping and ultra flash profiling sessions. Um, sweet and fruity attributes were used to characterize the rosé wines. Um, however, unlike the red wines where they kind of just said fruity, the participants actually used specific fruit attributes like apple, berry, and citrus. So they went a little deeper to describe the wines. Um, and really, when you looked at the two biplots from the rosé wines, they basically separated them based on their, their having a fruity flavor or a lack of fruity flavor. And those that were lacking a fruity flavor were associated with being earthy, dry, uh, having an aftertaste, and pungent and bitter attributes. Um, they also like to separate the wines based on the intensity of flavor overall. And in this case, they did write strong flavor versus and light flavor. And those rosés that had a light flavor were also described as being crisp. And those that were described, those rosé wines that were dry were associated with having a very strong overall flavor. All right, so we took the, uh, the most common terms from the rosés, uh, projective mapping and ultra flash profiling sessions. And then, then we decided to take some, some of the rosés and we moved on and we asked participants to evaluate them after looking at these nutrition labels. So first uh, they evaluated the wine blinded and then they evaluated the wine with the, the fabricated nutrition labels here. We actually made nutrition labels. It didn't just say 15 calories, 100 calories, 180. This is just for the slides here. So we went with these four levels, which we termed low, meaning 15 calories, normal, around 100 calories. And then we had our high and highest and 180 to two and 240 cal calorie labels. And what we did, we gave um, every participant, we gave them the wine, we asked them to evaluate it on nine point adonic scales for the appearance, the flavor, the mouthfeel, and the overall liking from one equals dislike extremely to nine equals like extremely. And after they were done that, we also asked them to answer a check all that apply question, which looks similar to this. And so they were just asked to look at the nutrition label on the computer screen, uh, drink the wine, and then um, check or click all the terms that they perceived in the sample. Um, we use the check or apply method because it's, it's pretty simple to perform and has produced re reproducible results with complex products like wine in the past. And so we went through and we did that. Um, and we asked them to evaluate and they invited, evaluated every wine blinded and with all four of the different nutrition labels. So every participant evaluated the wine blinded and with all four of uh, the, uh, the nutrition labels. And I think I'm, I don't know what I'm, I'm doing okay for time, but just briefly, uh, we did it basically the standard statistical analysis. We did a two-way ANOVA and two keys on a significant difference test to determine if there's differences in the overall liking. With the check all the apply data, we did our Cochrane's Q test and correspondence analysis. And then we did a penalty analysis using the uh, results of the overall liking nine point donic scale and then the, the CATA question. Um, I don't know, I'm not gonna dig too much in the stats because yeah, it doesn't seem fun. Um, so after we did all that, we looked at our overall liking and basically we found the caloric labels did not affect the participants overall liking at all. And then you can see here all the wines like I said, every wine was available at no uh, valued at no label, and then low, normal, high. And really, of all the wines, the only one that had a significant difference was in the rosé wine number three. For whatever reason, the highest in 2000, 
two, 240 calorie was like significantly more than all the other wine, but that seems to be a little bit of an outlier in the results as every other time there was no differences. Um, so we, we didn't find any difference in terms of the caloric values and um, the, the liking or the sensory perception of the, the rosé wine. This makes sense and supports evidence that taste is a significant determinant in our food choices and liking. And it also supports other research that has shown that the healthfulness of an alcoholic beverage does not have a significant influence on a person's choice. Um, this is kind of good news. I know that some uh, government re regulatory bodies have been leaning towards putting nutritional labels on alcohol beverages. And I know that there's been a lot of studies done showing that consumers want um, uh, nutrition fact tables on their alcoholic beverages, but we, at least in this study, looking at purely just the caloric values, we didn't see any difference. Um, and one other thing we found really interesting is in past research, there's been differences in based on gender when evaluating, evaluating our caloric labels. Um, and in our study, those that identified as a woman um, or those that identified as a man were not significantly um, impacted by the caloric labels at all. And there was no difference in the results for anything in terms of gender in our study, um, which was interesting actually, to be honest with you, the only difference was that our, the men in our study didn't like one of the wines being the low caloric wine. So actually they disliked uh, rosé wine number two when it was labeled as being low. But other than that, we didn't find any significant differences based on the caloric labels and yeah. I apologize, no one ever calls me, so. Um, yeah. All right, so then looking at the uh, penalty analysis and just using the penalty analysis once again with the can check all that apply and then overall liking, um, what we found was that fruit related attributes drove liking of the rosé wine. So the crisp, the sweetness, the berry and the light flavor right here, as you can see drove consumers overall liking of the wine. And then we had aftertaste sour astringent, which drove disliking of the, sorry, rosé wines. Um, overall, the descriptors you described the rose, uh, rosé wines displayed that consumers either put them in a category of containing fruit flavors or not containing fruit flavors. And based on the results of the penny and penalty analysis, those that contain fruit flavors are liked more. And the, 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 the fabricated caloric labels did not have an effect on consumers overall liking or sensory perception of the wine, which was good, but once again, a limitation that we only looked at caloric labels, uh, caloric values. We didn't have anything else um, in our nutrition facts table. All right, I'm looking at the time here. So I'm just gonna go through the sparkling wines. Um, and yeah, and then we'll, I'll answer questions, I guess. But moving on to phase four, we did do the sparkling wine again. And once again, we did use our projective mapping and ultra flash profiling. We had two different sessions with 157 participants. Um, they once again looked at separated wines based on the sweetness and the bitterness, and they were used frequently in both sessions. Um, they also liked the fruit related attributes, similar to the rose wine, and they separated the wine based on if the, they had um, fruit attributes or if they had earthy attributes. And they really didn't really break down the earthy attributes very much at all. They kind of just stuck to saying earthy, or some people said soil, but that was really it for the sparkling wine. And then, like it says here on the slide, we then took three of the sparkling wines and looked at how disclosure of production methods would affect their liking of the wine and if it would affect their sensory perception. So we had them evaluate three of the wines from the sparkling wine projected mapping sessions using nine point endonic scales and using um, the uh, check all the apply question again. And we did that once again blinded and with production claims. These were the production claims we, choose, we chose to include. 
Um, we first of all had the following traditional methods. We then moved on to the carbon neutral label and the organic because um, we've seen that consumers are having a demand, more of a demand for the application and more environmentally environmentally friendly practices in many different industries, including wine. And studies have found that consumers are willing to pay more for wine with sustainability uh, claims and characteristics, um, but they hadn't really, well, we hadn't seen any study looking at if that changed how they perceived the wine. And then um, we really wanted to look at three of them that seem to be gaining traction. You see a lot of, we, we went through a bunch of different wines sold in Nova Scotia, and a lot of them will say, traditional methods. Others will talk about sustainability. Um, and so we want to include the carbon neutral label. And then lastly, we want to include the organic wines. So once again, the consumers, they came and this time we didn't do a full crossover design. So that's the limitation of this study, but they came and they drank the wine blinded. They then entered, answered a questionnaire about their purchasing habits and how they feel about sustainability and what, the, what they know about wine, et cetera. And then they evaluate, evaluated the wine with only one of the production claims. So we only had the wine blinded and then with one of the production claims associated with the wine. And as you can see in this table here, realistically, if you look at the wines when they're blinded and when they have a production claim on them, there's really no differences. Um, you can see here wine two blinded and the wine with the carbon neutral label. There was no significant differences found in the liking of appearance or flavor, mouthfeel, the overall liking. And this can be reinforced when we look at the correspondence analysis from results. You can still see that they're all grouped based on the wine. They're not grouped uh, based on any production claim and stuff like that. But we did find some interesting things. Um, when we looked at the CATA frequency results, so how often um, different attributes were clicked, we found some differences in there. And the first was when the production claim carbon neutral was presented with wine two, the citrus and smooth attributes were presented much more frequently. And actually the amount of times the consumer clicked bitter uh, was significantly less. We also looked at when wine three was presented with a certified organic label, the attributes crisp, carbonated and pungent were chosen much more frequency once they thought the wine was organic. And lastly, when the wine five was presented with traditional methods, um, they more frequently used earthy and oaky to describe the wine than when that wine was evaluated blinded. So in conclusion about the sparkling wine, the wines were, the wines were separated into those that contain fruity attributes, um, the main ones being peach, pear, sweet, berry, and citrus, or earthy attributes, earthy, floral, burnt, oak, and wood. Um, the penalty analysis of the overall liking, which I didn't show, but in the CATA attributes determined that fruit-related attributes, crisp, sweet, apples, and citrus drove consumers' liking of the sparkling wine. And um, realistically, what ended up happening when we presented them with the organic or the carbon neutral, um, most participants demonstrated an increase in the use of more appealing attributes. So based on the penalty analysis, that would be citrus and smooth, and a decrease in the unappealing attributes like bitterness. Um, but the one thing that did stand up is when the wine was identified as organic, they did identify it as being more pungent more frequently. That may be because past studies have said that consumers classify organic wine as having distinctive taste. All right, um, overall conclusions from, uh, you know, a thousand consumers and 87 wines, uh, mainly the consumers mainly talked about the taste and the aromas of wine did not discuss the appearance or the mouthfeel very often at all. Um, the majority of our consumers had a low level of wine, but like I said, we're frequent consumers and they buy a lot of wine. Um, they are able to distinguish between the different wines, but they use very, very broad terms to describe the wine. They're not, you know, they're just saying fruity, earthy, sweet, bitter a lot. They're not digging any deeper. Um, and a quick thank you. Thank you to the Nova Scotia Department of Agriculture and Acadia University for funding this project. Also, thank you to all the participants for coming to drink wine. And lastly, thanks to all the students and research assistants who worked on this project. Um, for you, those of you that don't know, Acadia is um, a mainly an undergraduate university. So this was all conducted using undergraduate students doing their honors thesis and their, you know, being research assistants. So I really appreciate all the hard work they did on this study. 
And uh, yeah, thank you for listening. And does anyone have any questions, I guess? And I guess, yeah. Thank you, Matt, for, for your presentation. It's quite interesting to, to see all the, all the results from all this broad group of, of tasters. Uh, I have a, a question that I would like to ask you. Oh, mm -hmm. Here we are. Yeah. I will read you the first question that we receive, okay? Mm -hmm. Although caloric labeling didn't affect liking, does this necessarily mean it won't affect purchase decisions? That this might uh, be made on the basis of factors other than just liking, such as health, and likewise for environmental claims like organic, yeah, so um, I, I do I, I I understand that it will probably affect purchase behavior, and we did talk about that in our paper. Sorry, I should bring that up. Um, I, I figure that consumers will look at the nutrition label if it's available to them at the liquor store, and we know that you know with a product like wine, you don't always get to try it, um, so they're definitely going to use extrinsic information when making their purchasing decisions. That's correct. I would agree with that. Yeah. I, I have a question about the, the, the methodology because did you separate the, the wines, for example, the reds, depending the methodology of making, such as with a oak, without oak, uh, with some kind of these techniques in consideration? Um, so we separated, so of the four sessions, um, two of them were all blends and two of them were all single variety and that was it. And we just randomly assigned them in those two sessions. Yeah. We received a question, Matt, saying, are chemical analysis of Nova Scotia wines going to be conducted to evaluate potential origins of the cranberry aroma? I hope so. Um, that's the only thing I can say about that. Um, I'm hoping that would be done. Um, but to be honest with you, that's, I've kind of wrote a little bit of a grant hoping that will be done, but um, COVID kind of interrupted the flow of things. Uh, I should have said this project ended right before everything kind of stopped last March. So, but I hope it is done to figure out what's, what's this cranberry and what's going on because we have done, um, focus groups as wine consumers, um, having them drink the wine and try and explain the cranberry to me. And, and they are not doing a great job and I'm trying to figure out where it's coming from. Um, if the students identify as frequently buying wine, a wine not liking, what reason seems to drive this? Pardon, sorry, I missed the first part there. If a students identify as frequently buying wine and a wine not liking, what reasons seems to, to drive this? If they're frequent buyers of wine, but they don't have much liking of it, is that the question, sorry? And liking wine, thank you, Jonathan. If a students identify as frequently buying wine and liking wine, what reasons seem to drive this? Oh. What reasons seem to drive this? Ah, you got me there. I really don't know. I guess they like the wine, but they don't really worry about where it's coming from. Um, what, what varieties are in and stuff like that. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know if I have a good answer for that question. Yeah, was there a good correlation between the consumer's self asset knowledge of wine and the results of your own assessment as part of the tasting? Yeah, so um, most, most consumers self-identified of having a low knowledge of wine, but being highly interested in it. And we saw that in the objective wine uh, quiz. They, they were the consumers were pretty good at identifying. They didn't know much about wine other than they liked drinking it. So, yeah. Perfect, Matt. I also have a question. Meanwhile, our attendees are writing if they have more questions. Mm -hmm. um, I was curious when uh, you, you made the study and you got these descriptors, did you have a chance to compare the descriptors made by the attendees and the actual labels, what they were, if they were in line? So we did a study um, like that um, before this study actually started. 
And we found um, on average, if I remember correctly, sorry, it was a couple years ago, um, about 50% of the words that are currently on labels or were on labels at the time, this was 2016 in Nova Scotia, about 50% of them were used by participants. So if, if I remember correctly, so we were pretty happy. Mainly what happened was the bottle had way more descriptors than the consumers did um, when they described it, but yeah. Yeah, they they struggled a little bit with understanding some of the descriptors. We got a lot of questions around um, simple things, just like body um, and you know stuff like that. But they like like I said, if you go broad, they seem to be really good at that. And if you go a little you know a little bit further, like fruity, they understand, but giving them specific fruit was was not great. Perfect, thank you. And I think we receive a question in the chat, Francisco. Yes, I, I saw. Uh, will the result of being significantly different to do the survey with less Nova Scotia wine drinkers who had more knowledge of the different wines? Will we, will we be doing that? Will the, if the result being significantly uh, different if you do the survey with less Nova Scotia wine drinkers who had more knowledge of the different ones? Um, based on a study we did that was also an add-on to this project, we did, we did consumers versus uh, wine professionals on how they described wine and they were significantly different. And I would, I would, I would think that if you found more educated, uh, wine educated people, I think you'd find some differences. Um, I don't know, I, I think, I don't think the calorie study would change anyone who knows about wine, um, the opinion of the wine, but I could be wrong. We'd have to see. Thank you. I, I had one question related to, well, related to the, the varieties. Did you see any difference or to keep in consideration between Vitis vinifera varieties and hybrids? Um, we, I didn't really look too much into that, but th like I said, the participants did a really good job of when there was, let's say, two, two Baco Noirs in it, they definitely put them together. So they can just, they can definitely just find differences based on the varieties, but I didn't, I didn't look at that specifically, no. I can send you yeah. the data if you want to look at it though. Oh, that would be great. <laughs> that would be interesting. <laughs> Matt, I have another question is, will... Uh, will the findings help market Nova Scotia wines, for example, through the words on the bottle or advertising? I hope so. Um, that was why I ran the study. I really, um, you know, I feel that like what's like, especially right now with that, there's so many people interested in Nova Scotia wine, but they really don't it doesn't seem like they know what they're looking for. Let's give them a little bit of a, you know, a leg up. Let's use some words to understand. And, you know, maybe if we start with broad terms they get, and then we could even like start broad on the bottle and then have similar descriptors. Um, I mean, more specific descriptors underneath. I, I hope that will help people. I, um, I'm hoping it helps the Nova Scotia wine industry. And yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. I think Nicely, we, we cover all the all the questions. Perfect. Thank you very much, Matt, for your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, everybody, for joining us. And um, we would like to invite you for our next session, which will be on March 11 at 12 p.m. We will have Dr. Harrison Wright from AFC Kentville, and he will be talking about wine grape cold cases, frost, freezes, but hardness and viability. And we will soon send you a survey and um, we really appreciate your feedback. So please uh, join to that survey. And also we will send you the recording of this session so you can rewatch and send it to your colleagues. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact myself or Francisco. And finally, I also would like to invite you to the digital series of Minister of Agriculture. For more information, please visit Perenia's website. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matt.